Good morning, afternoon, or evening. My name is Mark Evanier. That's Paul Levitz over there. That's Walt Simonson over there. I'll tell you a little about them in a minute, but first I want to tell you about a man like this named Jack Kirby. Uh, I assume if you've tuned into this podcast, you know who Jack Kirby was. Uh, we are here to tell you that he was even more than you think he was. He was an amazing man, very nice, very kind, very generous. Uh, he was a kind of man who, if you were around him, you felt more talented. You just mm -hmm. felt more creative. And he inspired an awful lot of people, not just to write and draw comic books, but in all walks of life. Uh, there, I have met in my lifetime actors. I have met painters. I have met dancers. I once met a spot welder who claimed that Jack Kirby was the major <laughs> influence on his life. And I do not think Jack in his life ever even knew what a spot welder did. but. But something about Jack's work energ energized people and made them reach for to be better. And it was a, he was a very influential person. Uh, Walt Simonson is among a small group of people. Actually, it's not that small who I could name who I think did wonderful work uh, and still does writing and drawing stories that capture some of the same energy that Jack had, the same... It, the, the, achieve a lot of the same goals without imitating Jack. I don't, Walt, I've never seen in your work a swipe from Kirby. I've never seen a pose where I thought, oh, he's imitating a Kirby pose or a Kirby layout. But you still capture the same goal that Jack strove for of having dynamic, interesting art full of people that you cared about. And Paul Levitz, I'm going to talk more about later, but Paul uh, has held every managerial position you can have in the comic book field, mostly at DC Comics, where he was part of a regime we'll talk about that changed DC Comics and the life of Jack Kirby substantially. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this, this podcast. Um, Walt, when did you discover Jack Kirby work? And I want to narrow in on the new gods, if we can, at some point. Well, the, the, my first discovery, really, where I was taken by the work, I saw a couple of comics when I was a kid, the old Marvel Monster books for Atlas Comics. But I didn't know who Jack Kirby was. I don't know if they were credited. And I was a freshman in college in 1964 or early 65. I was in the dorm room of one of my friends, and they had a very well-read copy of Journey into Mystery, I think it's 113. It's the green, uh, the gray goblin, gray gargoyle's return, where Thor gets turned back into a mortal for a while because Odin's PO'd at him for still loving <laughs> Jane Foster. And they really crammed a great deal into 16 pages. And I, I was a big Norse mythology fan. I had never seen a Marvel comic before, never seen a Marvel comic before. And I hadn't, didn't really know Jack's work. And I was blown away by the comic. I was blown away by the, by the fact that there was, oh my gosh, there's a comic about Norse mythology. Wow! And I, I didn't care that he didn't have a red beard or he didn't have red hair or he didn't have iron gauntlets, any of that stuff. I wasn't a fan in that sense. I just loved it. I loved the fact that I could read it. The funniest part about it was that it starts off with a big fight scene and there's a caption that says, we promised old Jack Kirby we let him start with a big fight scene and blah, 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 lasts about two pages. And at the time, I hadn't looked at the credits. So I read that and I thought, wow, some fan wrote in and said, I'd love to see a giant fight scene. And they, they did a giant fight scene for Jack Kirby. And it wasn't until, I don't know, 20 years later, I was rereading the comic at some point, And I got to that and went, oh, no. <laughs> and I figured it out. But that was my introduction to Jack Kirby. And within about, what was that, 113, seven months, I discovered where they sold Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. And my first Marvel comic was Journey the Mystery 120, a, a Loki absorbing man story that Jack did, and I, I never looked back. Okay, were you drawing? At the, when you read that first comic, were you drawing? Were you an artist of any sort at that point in your life? I probably wouldn't use the word artist, but I certainly I drawn since I was really younger than I can remember. My mom tells me I was about four. I had mono when I was four years old. Back then, no video games, no, we didn't have a television, um, you know, lots of stuff. You're not reading a lot when you're four years old. I wasn't anyway. And so I had, she gave me a little table, lap table that sat on the bed. I could sit up and, and she brought, had a bunch of paper. My dad would bring paper, used paper, home from the office. 
and I would draw on it. And so my drawing really began when I was when I was ill, and then after I got better, I just kept drawing. And so I would I had been drawing all the time by the time I had discovered I discovered Marvel Comics. All right, and and uh, who were the artists besides Jack Kirby that you liked when you were young? Oh, well, without knowing it, because none of the names, I, I was a kid in the 50s, none of the names were on books. Alex Toth was one of them. Um, Gil Kane would have been one of them. Uh, I didn't see much Ditko at the time. That came later. Uh, and beyond that, I just loved comics. I read every kind of comic I could find. I Classics Illustrated, all, oh, a good crack of thunder. Crack, um... The movie movie adaptations, John Buscema, I loved without knowing. He did an adaptation of Helen of Troy, the Robert Wise movie, and it was beautifully drawn, and I loved it as a child. So there were a whole handful of books, and Little Iodan, I loved Karl Barks. I had no idea who Karl Barks was. I loved John Stanley's work, who did Little Lulu, no idea who John Stanley was. So at the time, I just read a lot of books, and I wasn't very critical of the art, but I did know, for example, who the good duck man was. And I did know, you know, from looking at it, I knew his work from reading it. I was also a big Alberto Gioletti fan without knowing it. I was a big Turok, Son of Stone fan. And he also had, driven, had drawn a Zorro comic right before Disney took over the franchise. There were a handful of Zorro comics. Uh, Kinsler drew a couple, I think. I forgot who the other artist. And Gioletti drew the last one. I loved, that was my favorite. I had that one. I loved, I loved the drawing. It was rich liquid inking and drawing and it wasn't until years later I went back, I don't know, I'm familiar with Turok I went back and I was looking at it one day and I went good lord, I think this is Alberto Gioletti and I went and looked it up and I found indeed it was so I was a fan of lots of different artists with a variety of styles and I, I absorbed as much as I could from all those guys at the time I should point out to the viewers, first of all, Alberto Gioletti was an Italian artist who did a lot of work for Western Publishing on the Dell and Gold Key comics. Uh, people know him probably best for having a long run drawing the Star Trek comic books for them. Uh, I should also mention that Paul and Walter are, are in areas where it is raining and it is thundering <laughs> outside the Simonson residence right now, and yep. which is appropriate when we're talking about Thor. Uh, and I should also tell you, if you have, don't watch a lot of podcasts, at this very moment, I don't look like it, but I'm looking at Walt. If I'm looking at, if I'm looking at Paul, it looks like I'm looking at Walt. If I'm looking at Walt, it looks like I'm looking at Paul. Uh, I am, I am, I'm actually paying attention to my guests here. It's just because of the way cameras work. It's a little distracting. Um, now, Paul, you got into comics, what age? Remind me. Got, got into as a reader or professional? As a, as a reader. As a reader, probably around five years old. Yeah, that's that's about it. Where I was, I I always tell people that when I was born, the doctor slapped me and I dropped a copy of Walt Disney's comics and stories. But I was reading actively all that time. When you and I first met, Paul, you were publishing a fanzine called I think Etc. And then it became the Comic Reader. I helped you out with that in the basement of your house in Brooklyn, in Bless the you. early seventies. <laughs> yes. Pizza in return. That was you. That's right. Thing. Yes, and and I remember we we also were sitting there for a while writing fake letters for letter columns for various <laughs> comic books, um, and then you came into management at DC Comics as an assistant editor and then an editor, and there was a point there when you were in charge of who inked everything and when they had to have it in and things like that, and eventually you ascended to. Now, at one point, you were the president, and at one point, you were the publisher, or the other way around, or something like that there. I, uh, I had something to do with running the company for a very long time. Okay. Now, what was your exact position during the time the original New Gods books came out? When the New Gods stuff started coming out, I was doing my fanzines. And one of the great treats was that Jack would send in the, the finished work. This was at the point that... It had shifted from Vinny inking it to Mike Royer, so it was coming in from Jack as a finished package. So this would have been the middle of 71 or so. Yeah, right. early 71, because when the stuff was coming in ahead of when it was published. Yeah. Uh, and that art would land on Carmine's assistant's desk, a woman named Carol Fine, who was basically another incarnation of Fran Drescher. <laughs> 
Carol had absolutely Fran Drescher's voice before Fran Drescher did. This wonderfully, utterly booming and unfiltered um, Bayside Queens accent um, that she was thrilled at any, at any volume. And Carol was one of the people, you know, she wasn't a whole hell of a lot older, probably early 20s at that point. She was willing to put up with fans and be hospitable. And uh, occasionally I would be able to be standing there and just pawing through these pages that had just come in of what was some of the most interesting work being published by DC at the time. One of the things that we, we should mention here, there was a, a, a member of the DC staff uh, in those days who doesn't get any real recognition from Kirby fans for his contribution. But there was a man named E. Nelson Bridwell, who was an assistant editor for DC. And he was kind of Jack's liaison at times. In fact, for a while, when Coletta was inking the books, when Vince Coletta was inking Jack's work, Coletta would turn the pages in to Nelson initially and Nelson would actually take the eraser because Vinny handed in his pages unerased. Uh, and he would erase the pages. And he was becoming one of the people saying, this man is not inking everything on the page. <laughs> and he called Jack. Or he'd actually call me a couple of times. Say, can you talk to Jack? They will listen to me. Anyway. Um, and he was one of the people really on Jack's side back there. It's not everyone was because DC had a history of hostility to Marvel Comics at that point. There was, there are people there who just felt uh, that, you know, the DC Comics were fabulous, the Marvel Comics were garbage, and, um, you know, the worst thing you could say about a DC comic that was it looked like a Marvel comic. <laughs> and when Jack Kirby drew it, it looked like a Marvel comic in many ways. Uh, now, you ascended to more important positions within that company, and there came a point when Mr. Infantino, a fabulous artist we all, whose art we all loved, was no longer the publisher and running DC. And there was an interim period there when it felt like nobody was running DC. And then in came a woman named Jeanette Kahn. And you and Jeanette eventually farmed a team there that um, uh, changed DC comics, changed comics a lot, but changed DC comics. Y you are too modest to say this, but I will say that Prior to the advent of the Khan, Levitz, and to some extent Dick Giordano regime there, um, I had a very negative view of DC Comics from a managerial viewpoint. There were people at DC Comics who I did not feel treated the talent very well, treated them as very expendable, treated them as very interchangeable. And Jack was arguing a lot with them about the way they treated him and everyone else. And I've kept finding these cases where Jack would say, you know what you guys ought to do? You ought to do this for the talent. You ought to do this. You ought to do this. And they would not only, they, instead of saying what was probably the truth, which was we don't want to do that, they'd say we can't do that. Legally, we can't let you guys have your original art back. Legally, we can't give you creator credits. Legally, we, there were all these reasons that all proved to be bogus. Almost everything that you people, you, you and Jeanette and Dick, changed about the company was something that your predecessors had said they could not do. And as a result, we suddenly had a company now, and, and Infantino, to his credit, did it start instituting some of this before he was removed. But suddenly we had a company that seemed much more creator friendly, not just to Jack Kirby, but to everyone. And you had people's work not being tampered with as much. You had original art being returned. You had royalties being paid on reprints. You had incentive, whatever they call the uh, payments for when your work sold very well. There were quite a few upgrades to the industry, which had they not been made, probably would have had an awful lot of talented people fleeing the industry. I don't think some people have ever understood that you have to treat people well to get good work out of them. Uh, so, there came a moment there that one of the major triumphs of changing the way the business was done for you involved Jack Kirby because Jack was kind of being lured back to DC having left in the latter days of Carmine's administration and I remember Jeanette coming up to me at a San Diego con saying can you help us convince Jack Kirby to come back to DC Comics mm 
and, and actually she came up to me and asked me if I would like to write a New Gods comic for them. And I said, I really would like nobody to write a New Gods comic but besides Jack Kirby. And Walt, no offense to Walt, who later did some very fine ones. <laughs> but by that point, a lot of people had taken their shot at the, those characters. Um, tell me, if you can, Paul, a little bit about... I remember Jeanette came up to me and she said, I asked her, did you look at the sales figures for New Gods? And she said, yeah, they were, it sold fine. It was, it was a decent selling book. It, it shouldn't have been canceled. What, what was your understanding of that? Well, I mean, that was one of the things that when I got access to the old sales records, I looked at myself as a comic fan, right? They were something I'm just curious about. We got, the whole fourth world group was doing fine. You know, they, a lot of what went wrong in that period of Jack's work had to do with what Carmine's perception of what bringing Jack to DC would do. You know, Jack was an enormous influence on Carmine as a young artist. He was the earliest, with Joe Simon, the earliest superstars in the business. Those guys who got, who got triumphant sound effects every time their names were mentioned. Um, and those guys who got cover credit or got names that used in the advertising. And of course, Jack had done amazing things for Marvel through the 60s into the early 70s. And I think Carmine clearly viewed this as something, a moment that would be transformative for DC. And he paid Jack well by the hideous standards of the business at the time. But in order to pay Jack well, he turned to Vinny and said, I'll give you a lot of extra inking to do. You like inking Jack. You did wonderful stuff on him years ago, or some of some of the Fantastic Four work was pretty good. Um, I'll give you a lot of his pages, but I got to ask you to take a, a lower rate. And Vinny was happy to take it, but part of why he tended not to ink everything on the page is he was a very commercially minded guy in terms of the commerce of his own business. And if he was getting paid essentially in his mind, X dollars an hour, he'd give you X dollars an hour worth of work. Um, and if he could get away with doing a little less, maybe he would get away with doing a little less. And that showed in the work to Jack's frustration and certainly the frustration of a lot of other people, certainly Nelson, who was in America who had seen pencils. But taking the big view of what you were talking about, Mark, when Jeanette got to DC, she was a person of terrific creative spirit and terrific personal morality. Rabbi's daughter, I'll give her dad a little bit of a credit for the morality. And in her own experience, she had created a couple of magazines, most importantly, something called Dynamite, and felt that she had not gotten a good business deal on it and ended up doing the company she had created at for Scholastic fighting over what her fair share was. That gave her a lot of sympathy for the creator's situation. And the industry as a whole, which was very, very small at that moment in the late 1970s, probably 200 creative people, depending on how you define it, maybe a half dozen publishers of comics in America, all clustered around the New York area, except for a handful of guys, you and your compatriots out in Los Angeles doing funny animals for Western. Um, everybody was very disenchanted. It was the period that led to a lot of the experiments that led to the graphic novel, things like Bill Kane's His Name is Savage, Blackmark, things like Eisner's work on Contract with God, or they were looking to get honest jobs somewhere else because this wasn't, this wasn't a good living. And it, it all, and it also wasn't an industry that looked like it would be around to some people for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of the editors were saying, please, Lord, let this last until my pension gets in. Yeah. Let, let me back up and say a couple of things about Vince Coletta for a second, because I think Vinny gets a raw deal sometimes. I felt he was the wrong anchor for Jack, even when he took his time. I felt he was just the, the wrong guy stylistically. Walt, in your life, you have sometimes been inked by the wrong person. <laughs> uh, and uh, I felt that. But one of the reasons Coletta was eager to grab the um, 
the Kirby, the, that huge body of work, was that his specialty, romance comics, were dying out. DC's romance, DC had just canceled two of their five romance comics and inserted lots of reprints into the other. So Vinny suddenly had 60% less work or whatever the, the, the statistic mm -hmm. was. And secondly, uh, the reason that DC wanted Coletta on Inking Kirby was not just monetary. There were people there who felt that Vince Coletta toned down Kirby's style, and they didn't like Kirby's style. As I've told many times, the first time I visited the DC offices with my friend Steve Sherman, he, Saul Harrison, the production manager, sat us down and said, you've got to get Jack to draw more like Kurt Swan. <laughs> and and when Jack didn't draw more like Kurt Swan, they brought in other people to make his Superman look more like Kurt Swan's. And that was an, a, an attitude there, which, which I believe that your regime there kind of expunged. People's work did not get wholesale redrawn when you and Dick and Jeanette were running the place. And Archie Goodwin and Denny and there's other people involved in management, we should say, there at various times. Uh, but uh, Coletta was... You know, not a guy, when people get mad at inkers and things like that, I think they forget the fact that, you know, every time Vince Coletta inked an issue of Thor, Stan Lee said, great job, Vinny, here's the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, he didn't sneak into the middle of the night and steal the pages away to ink. He was assigned to them by his employer. And DC was very happy with what Coletta did in King Jack. And the fact that Jack was not happy with it. Uh, didn't matter to them until finally Jack made a. Jack, Jack was a lot. Was very cooperative. He wanted to be a good team player. He also hated the coloring that D, he got from DC, and he learned early on that that was a dead issue, that the DC coloring department would not tolerate criticism of their work, and so he kind of went along with that. He had to pick the battles he would fight, and that was one he chose not to fight. Although we did fight over the coloring of Mr. Miracle's costume. That was the one, the one battle he won. Uh, anyway, so now you guys are now remaking DC, trying to make it more creator-friendly. And Jeanette is saying, among other things, gee, I wish we had Jack Kirby here. She has looked at the sales figures on the old New Gods books, as you did, and seen, you know, she said these should not have been canceled. And they immediately reinstated a New Gods project. I think, was it Don I Newton did. who did the first one, I believe, and, and such. And... I think somebody kind of realized, you know, that, you know, the new gods at that stage, the new gods without Jack Kirby was like the Dick Van Dyke show without Dick Van Dyke or something of that sort. Uh, so t t tell the story, if you could, about how the, uh, the financial arrangement that was made with Jack, because it's fascinating. It was the first time in years that Jack Kirby had received anything from a comic book company, but his flat X dollars per page fee. Well, by the, by the early 80s, we had put in place a system where if you had created a new character, either to add to a mythology, like a new a Huntress into the Batman mythology, or an entirely new book, you would receive a percentage of the earnings from media or toy licensing or apparel licensing or any sort of outside money. And this was designed to incentivize people to create more stuff because we had a period in the industry where even the best talent were saying, I'll write Superman, but I'm just going to use the villains he's got. I'm just going to use the character he's got because I don't want to give them something new because what do I get out of it? Um, you're giving me a flat page rate, I'll give you a flat job. And the idea was to change that mindset and ultimately to have royalties on the books that said, if we succeed, you succeed and you will benefit along with this. And it began to change, not only DC, but the industry, because it basically forced Marvel to go along with it. Jim Shooter did a good job convincing the Marvel management that they had to, even though it was more expensive for them than it was for DC, because they were yes. selling these days. Let me, if I might interrupt just for a second, just to make sure. an example of that. Um, I did a, I drew a book, X-Men versus or meets the Teen Titans one of the industry crossovers, the fourth of the industry crossovers. Chris wrote it, Marvel produced it. So Weezy edited it, Chris wrote it, I drew it, Terry Austin inked it, Glennis Ween and Tom Wojciechowski colored and lettered it. At the beginning of that project, there were no royalties. 
Hmm. So we were getting a flat rate for whatever the flat rate was, whatever my page rate was back then. And by the time that project came out and was published, there were the royalty plan, thank you, DC Comics, had been put into place. And essentially, my, my income, whatever it was back then, went up by about a third. Hmm. So it was a really significant boost for a lot of freelancers who were thrilled with royalties. And it was a, a big income maker for a lot of us. And it was also very incentivizing to start trying to bring in new characters and create situations that would improve the sales of the book because now you had a stake in it, which before you had not. And well, I think it, well, well, if, if you, if that had never happened, if you were to this day, any comic book you draw was paid at a flat page rate, no reprint fees, no incentive for sales or piece of foreign sales, would you still be in the business? Well, I think I still don't get any foreign sale money from Marvel Comics, I believe. <laughs> so I am still doing stuff occasionally. Um, you know, it's hard to say uh, because I, my income would have been different. But I, I, get, I love doing comics. I, you mentioned earlier the idea that back in the 70s, most of us, most of us on the freelancer end, thought comics were dying and that they were going to be gone in 10 years. And a lot of us, money notwithstanding, me, Howard Shake, and a bunch of other guys, we would talk about this. We love doing comics. And we thought we want to do comics as long as the business is there. And once the business crashes and burns and fades away, then we'll go find real jobs. <laughs> and so that was, that turned out not to have to happen, fortunately. I never had to get a real job. But I did find, I, I mean, I just do find doing comics for most of my, 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 all of my career has been so much fun that it was probably worth it to me one way or the other. What I might have done earlier than I have done is I might have moved on and tried to do a creator own book of some kind rather than doing as much materials I've done work for hire for the companies. But I've enjoyed the characters for work for hire. I've enjoyed the characters I've, I've gotten to write and draw. And I'm completely happy with the way things worked out. But you know, it's hard to say whether it would have changed my attitude toward what I was doing if the if it was really still flat rates and no royalties and you know not much in the way of reprint money. I don't know how that would work out. You know, when I met Jack, I met Jack in 1969, and then in 1970, Steve Sherman and I took a visit to New York, where we went to, spent a couple of days at the DC offices, a couple of days at the Marvel offices, a day and a half with Steve Ditko, and three days at a Phil Suling New York convention, high atop what is now and will soon no longer be the Pennsylvania Hotel. And uh, I met during that those days. I met Carmen Fantino and Julia Schwartz and Robert Kaniger and Joe Hubert and Joe Orlando and Don Heck and Joe Sinnott and Gene Cole. I met everybody who had drawn a comic book or written a comic book. I had loved, well, not everybody, but an awful lot of them. And I did not find a lot of people who wanted to remain in comics. They were doing it because it was at that moment their best way of making a living, but they were all eyeing the door. What happens if this all collapses? What happens if I can't generate you know, work that pleases the current regime, whatever it is. And and I looked at Jack Kirby, who was about as successful as you could get in terms of making money for your employer. And he was not counseling a career in comics. He was advising any kid who came to him with art samples to look what else besides comics they could do. He famously told Wendy Peeney, uh, who was then Wendy Fletcher, you're too good to be in comics. If I catch you drawing comics, I'll spank you. <laughs> and when she did, and, and when she, and when she did start doing comics, basically create her own comics, which were not an option when she met Jack. Uh, she kept going to Jack at the at the convention every year, saying, "Jack, you want to spank me now? I'm drawing comics. You want to spank me?" <laughs> yeah. And Forrest Ackerman would have, but Jack didn't do that. Anyway, so uh, uh, I just felt the entire industry shift in not wholly because of what happened at DC but because of the fact that anything was happening that said this that that thought that it was good business to be creator friendly and now we got to, I mean, we've interrupted Paul getting to the meat of the story right. about Kenner toys and such so go ahead Paul I'm sorry but again finishing the background I mean I think part of the difference part of why Walt's expressing himself the way he is there was a difference between the artists and the writers. The writers 
had a clearer point of view of where they might go. Maybe it was delusional. You know, Jerry and Roy going off wanting to write movies. Lennon, I remember Lennon and Marv at one point aspiring to write television like Laugh-In, not that they were ever going to go that route. It was animation writing. The number of places that an artist who was good at drawing comics could easily go was smaller than the number of places a writer could go. Not That's necessarily, true. and not necessarily any more creatively rewarding. Advertising had its own miseries attached to it. Um, so there was a different psychosis. But so we had improved things from a certain point. We could not, for a variety of complicated business reasons, feel comfortable or put through the corporation going back to the beginning of time and saying, you know, if you've created something at any point in the history of DC, we'll give you a piece of the action. Partly because there were some incredible properties like Superman and Batman that you know, made the corporation so much money that they were not interested in giving up a greater piece of in the deal. In the early 80s, because of Jack's fight with Marvel over his original art, he was kind of a poster boy for having been mistreated. This was one of the great geniuses of the field. He was an old guy by this point. He was still working really hard in animation, but that was you know, very visibly pushing a guy beyond what he should have to do. And he had given the industry so much, given all of us as readers so much, that Jeanette and I, Dick, Joe Orlando, whose name we didn't mention, another member of the, the DC team, all were very sympathetic to Jack's situation. And we had a, an opportunity to place our toy line with a new partner. And we'd done a big presentation and gone out to Mattel, gone out to Kenner. Those were the two big candidates. They were both very interested. We ultimately decided to go with Kenner. Kenner. And one of Kenner's frustrations when they looked at what we had to offer was we didn't have really great villains for our characters by comparison to what Marvel had over the years. A lot of the DC villains outside of the Batman villains were colorful, but not incredibly threatening or dangerous. And a lot of the, we didn't have the grand cosmic villains that Marvel had. We hadn't had, we hadn't had Jack. And when that was clear, we said, you know, it would be great to get Jack. And maybe we could use Jack's characters that he's already done for us, Dark Side and the whole Apocalypse gang, and bring that into the story. Is there a way we can do this that we can justify giving him the piece of action that we give the current team? He only created a few years before our cutoff. It's not like we're giving up money we're already making because we haven't yet started to license these characters. So we came up with the idea, and I don't remember which of us came up, came up with it, but we collectively came up with the idea of commissioning Jack to do some redesign work, some fresh thinking on all the characters that would justify going back and doing a deal to give him the same kind of equity though he created it now. That wasn't popular with all of the older creators. I remember a uh, very passionate letter from the spouse of one of the great creators of the business, quoting the since 76, since 76, since 76, and sort of why not us um, when the announcement was out about Jack, which I could be personally very sympathetic to, but I couldn't solve. Um, but we could hide behind that redesign moment. And we negotiated a, that's basically standard for our deal at the time, but probably a more sophisticated, more complex contract because Jack by that time was represented by real lawyers and protective of his interest. A deal that would provide him with a share. And that meant that he got a share of the Kenner toys. He also got a share it's probably the larger money of all of the Hanna-Barbera episodes of Super Friends or Super Powers that we incorporated Dark Side and the group into. 
you know, Jack made very good money as an artist most of his career because by an early age, he was getting the best rates in the business because he deserved them. And he was faster than pretty much everybody else in the business. And he was harder working than anybody in their right mind could have been. Yes. So he could produce more work in a day than some artists produce in a week or Walter can produce in several weeks. Um, but let's, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Walt, Walt, when you were drawing a comic that was comparable in art density to Jack Kirby, how many pages a week would you would you output? You know, I, you get asked questions about how long it takes to do stuff occasionally, and I don't really keep a timer on stuff. So when I give you an example, a couple of examples, and they're very different. Um, I did a strip called Manhunter back in the very beginning of my career. That I mean, I began doing that when I was six months into my career. And there are plenty of people who think that's still the best work I ever did. And they might not be wrong. But essentially, Archie Goodwin, who wrote it and who proposed this strip, uh, he and I worked together on it. He asked me to draw it uh, as a very young artist. And we were doing essentially 20-page stories in eight-page format, an eight-page format. There was a lot in there. And so I learned, well, in the very beginning, Archie, he often did this anyway, I think not just with me, he would draw thumbnails for each page on what was then called typewriter paper and would now be copier paper. But he would draw it and he would, and I, the early Manhunters, first couple at least, I think I just pretty much followed his layouts as a way of getting to getting all that stuff in. But we figured out pretty rapidly, or I figured out, we had to do a lot of panels. So I have some pages in there that are probably anywhere to like 14, 15, 16 panels. There are a few splashes here and there. Um, but I learned a great deal about cramming a great a lot of stuff in and trying to make it readable at the same time. And that was a bi-monthly book. That was in the back of Detective Comics. It was a bi-monthly comic. And it took me pretty much all of two months to pencil and ink one chapter of Manhunter, which is eight pages long. So okay, but, roughly but if, a if month, somebody, a, a if, somebody came, if somebody came to you and said, we need you to pencil an issue of Thor with the issue, with the same kind of tightness and detail that, you know, was handed to one of Jack's inkers, can, how, how long would it take you to, to pencil? What, what deadline would you be comfortable with drawing that story? 20 pages, well, let's say. I could, I could certainly, if I, if I sit down and work, and now that I'm old, I don't work anywhere near as hard as I did when I was younger. But back in the day when I sat down and worked, I could crank out. I mean, I could do a page in a day. Okay. Um, a, a, I, a page, all right. That's all I need to know. Page I in could a day. do that. Okay. I, Jack was doing three pages a day of that kind of work generally. So. That's, I mean, that's more John Byrne speed. Okay. <laughs> John was doing about three pages a day when he was really working on the FF. I've done more than a page in a day, but mm, I'd rather not because I want to take a little more time on this stuff. Okay. Now, Jack's deal at DC for most of the time when he was doing The New Gods and then on to Commandy and the Demon and those other books was 15 pages a week. He occasionally did more, but he had a minimum. He got played a lump sum that presumed that lump sum presumed he would do 15 pages a week. Plus, he got paid as the editor and writer of the books as well. Um, money he did not get at Marvel for doing essentially the, most of the same stuff. Um, you, if somebody came to you and said, "Well, here's a contract. We want you to pencil 15 pages a week," you couldn't have done that, could you? Well, I couldn't do it now. I the the mo I had it, I had an assistant briefly, where I had I was late on an issue of the Fantastic Four. It had to be done. I had to do it. Uh, I work on a series of steps, and I was able to. This was a guy who could draw quite well. I was able to have him do little structure drawings. I could light box, and then I could do my own stuff as well. And I had one day, and as you may know, if you have one great day, you always think, oh, I could have this day again. And really, <laughs> there's no chance you will ever have that day again. Yeah. And so there was one day where I got up in the morning. I was at the board by 7. I quit at 1 in the morning. I took time out to go to the bathroom and eat dinner, eat food. And by the time I was done that day, I had 14 pages of pencils done. Wow. I will never do that again in my life, and I never did it before that. I will never do it again, and I would. So I could do. I know if I really had to crunch it. When I was doing Thor for Marvel, um, I tend to work with a deadline, the buckshot of the deadline getting closer to me. If the buckshot's a good distance away, I'm not working that hard. 
if the buckshot is coming right up to my rear end, I'm working much harder. And so I would, uh, I would do say four pages of Thor pencils. I could do four pages of Thor inks in a day, but only in the last week, right before it had to be <laughs> okay. turned in. But not on the not in the regular course of things. Well, okay, so two, we, pa uh, two pages in a day would be that'd be a full day for me. All right, good. Uh, now, Paul, what, what 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 did I interrupt to, to ask that question here? I've I've, I've well, lost the, the. You know, we had we train. had this long feeling about being able to step in and do something that would help Jack. Yeah, and it helped DC as well because we did get a, a lot of use out of Dark Side and the characters, who were terrific characters, obviously. You know, and I don't think the money that we paid Jack as royalties on all of that was particularly life changing. Jack had made a lot of money as an artist. No, no, it, it was. It, it it was in the sense that it was the right money for a change. It yeah, was something. I mean, there was a quote that came around the business. I, I maybe you said it, or maybe somebody put words into your mouth. Was when at some point at that time it said, "We just paid Jack." more money for dark side than Marvel had paid him for all the other characters combined or something like that. you remember that quote it was yeah. it was did you say that or or I I used that I used that line at the time in some fashion or another this is but that wasn't a very high threshold you know at that No point, but that but it was still a principle that your predecessors yeah. at that company had said would never happen and other people at Marvel had said it would never we cannot do that the you thing know, was the difference was not that that let Jack buy a swimming pool. That let Jack feel like he was being treated a different way. And it also, it also, but it also meant to a guy who was having trouble with one of his eyes and was having health problems, mm -hmm. there's a possibility I can get money for not filling pages. Yeah. It's a possibility that down the line there will come money in for my family that isn't X dot time the number of pages, X times the number of pages mm -hmm. that I, I hand in. And that was very meaningful to a guy who'd, who'd been told over and over and over again, we cannot do that. And who had basically kind of trapped him until he found that escape hatch into animation. He felt enormously trapped. That's why Jack did so many stories about prisoners and escape artists in his career. He felt enormously trapped in, you know, the village of the prisoner and, and that he just could not get break down that little barrier where of the company saying, we only pay for filling up pages. And you were paying him for something other than filling up pages. And some of those sums did become, you know, they may have seemed trivial to DC Comics. They may have seemed trivial from your viewpoint. But, you know, Jack would get a check. And it's like, there's braces for my kids. There's oh, yeah. health insurance. There's, there's you know, a, a big payment on the mortgage, uh, whatever it is. I mean, that I is meaningful for a guy who was so vested in doing right for his family. I think most of the years when the Kenner line and the Super Power show was on, the check was certainly large enough to buy a nice car every year. I mean, it's, it was not large enough to buy a nice house, but if you, you know, if you think of sort of your orders of magnitude, sometimes I got a royalty check for the one cameo that I did in one of Frank's, in Frank's spirit movie, and my residual check was $11 for my cameo. And you know, that, that that's the ro that's the royalty check that will buy you McDonald's, and then there's the royalty check that will buy you a nice dinner, which feels a little better. And then I remember sending Wheezy her check on her work on the Death of Superman stuff. That was such a success that I insisted on mailing out the checks with handwritten notes to the key people who had done it. I don't know that you could have bought the house for the check. But you could have bought a house for the check, and we the, the reason Walt the reason Walt is is grinning is Wheezy. For those of you who don't know, is Louise Simonson, wife of Walt, and a very fine editor and writer of comics on mm -hmm. her own. Uh, there, okay. And go I, ahead. Was, I was yeah. thrilled to be married to a woman who was making more money than I was. <laughs> Good plan, um, yeah. and better looking too. Yeah. Absolutely. Mel, Mel, Mel Brooks once said he married Anne Bancroft because he wanted to marry someone who made more money than he did. <laughs> so, yes. Um, but, you know, yeah. so there, there's scale to all of these things. 
the difference for the business in all of this was that we created an atmosphere where putting in the extra effort could benefit the person as well as benefit the company. Most of the time it didn't. You know, comic book people are enormously creative, are insanely hardworking on average. And the vast majority of what gets created didn't go anywhere for decades. Maybe now lots of stuff is, is move, moving through the rest of the media world and generating some more money. But that wasn't true for a very long time. But we created a world that said, we're all going to win together if we win at all. And that got a lot of people to stay a little longer, to take a bigger chance, and to feel better about themselves. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's felt that they were rewarded properly in the process or that the, you know, the, the exact deal was right at the time. There's no magic single right deal. But before we did those things, there were individual deals with very small startup companies that were very creator friendly. But there wasn't a serious player in the game saying the right way to do business is to treat these people the same way that an author would be treated in book publishing or that a serious creator would be treated in film or television. They should have a stake in what's going on. And every one of these industries has instances where they abuse the creators and every, but every industry has examples where they treated some great creator well or badly. But we didn't do this just as deals for two or three hot people at the time. It wasn't just that you know, Frank Miller is the star of the day, so you know, he's got the Frank Miller deal. It was everybody who's working for us will have a chance to succeed on pretty much the same terms. And that, I think, was really one of the major reasons for the turnaround in the comics industry in the 80s. Not the only reason, there were a lot of different factors. But it really changed the atmosphere for the creative people of DC, Marvel, and empowered the creative community to take chances they wouldn't have taken otherwise. It's work that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, I could not have accomplished it without Jeanette. We were you know, a terrific team. She was the, the idealist who would fight for things that previous publishers, previous executives would not have, would not have thrown themselves on the sword to fight for. And I was the structuralist who understood the ways that, well, if I take a dollar from this pocket, I can label the dollar over here differently, and the company will still have the same or greater profitability, and we'll have a better chance to do better. And you know, if, if I make it look like this, it'll be more palatable to the parent corporation, and we can make the system work that way. So it was, yeah. it was fabulous team. I, I, I should, I should have been... I'm sorry. I should mention here briefly, and this is this, this is not going to sound like it's about Jack Kirby, but it is. I have in my head a number of mental. I have a very good memory um, back to my childhood and meeting people like that. And I remember one of the first people I met in comics was Jerry Siegel, and I'd go visit Jerry, and Jerry was very very angry. This is 1969, 68 even actually, about the way he was treated by DC Comics. He was being treated like an enemy. It was almost like, how dare you give us our most valuable property, sir? You know, and he was, he would, he would, I, he would start telling me about how DC had treated him and he would start turning like, you know, it was like Bill Bixby about to turn into Lou Ferrigno. He would, he was getting angry and I would change the subject for fear. I just didn't want to be there when Jerry Siegel had a stroke. I mean, and calm him down. Flash forward to many, many decades later, and I'm in Jerry's and Joanne's apartment in Marina del Rey, a beautiful condominium. And Jerry is at great peace and happy. And I mentioned Paul Levitz. And he said, oh, Paul's been so good to us. I could not have conceived a day at one point when, when Jerry would do anything but curse the name of anybody who got a paycheck from DC Comics. And this was about four weeks before Jerry passed. And I, if, as a personal level, I got to see him having come full circle to a, a, feel, a, a place of peace 
and feeling appreciated and feeling like he had won something, that he got something out of Superman besides the money he got in the 40s. And Jack, there was the same thing with Jack. Jack felt very well treated by DC and such. And on a personal level, I was very grateful to you know, the regime here I'm talking about for making that change in time for Jack Kirby to, to, to benefit from and such. Now, I want to talk also about a moment. Um, DC began reprinting. The, the creator-friendly part of it got Jack back to do the Hunger Dogs graphic novel and to do some other little projects for DC. And he did a Super Powers miniseries that he worked on and such. He would probably never have come back there for the old regime. Um, and then at some point, DC began reprinting The New Gods. There was a series of three paperbacks, which now look very primitive. They were in black and white with gray tones on them, reprinting The New Gods, Forever People, and Mr. Miracle. I remember you, Paul, and a couple of other people there calling to consult with me, and I wrote the forewords or the afterwords for them. Uh, we can't really at this point gamble on putting The New Gods out in reprint in color but we're going to put them out in this black and white format. And they came out, and I was back in New York one day, and I was talking to you and Jeanette, and you said to, said to, both of you said to me, the sales figures on these Kirby paperbacks are wonderful. We should have done them in color. We will do them over again in color in a few years. These are enormously, you know, People are flocking to these books. They're selling very well. And I said to you, is it okay if I call Roz Kirby and tell her that? And okay. you said, sure, fine. So I went down. I used Julia Schwartz's phone because he wasn't in the office that day. And I called Roz and I told her, I'm up at D.C. And they just told me that I quoted what you guys had said. And Roz started crying. And she started saying, uh, over and over, she said, well, Jack always said they'd be a hit. Jack always said they'd be a hit because that was a sticking point in their lives, that people were dismissing those books as failures. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted you and on this podcast, Paul, is I want people to hear from someone who saw the actual sales figures that those books were not disasters and, and, and flops in the first place. But also, and, and also, let's remember, DC had a lot of, when those books first came out, DC was in a lot of turmoil because of the 25 cent price tag, which took mm -hmm. the sales down on everything. And, and Marvel had but was getting better distribution and Marvel was just, you know, mopping the floor with DC on everything at that point. But when I told J uh, Roz that the books, the new gods was selling well and that the DC was going to reprint them in color soon on even better paper, she started crying and she was so happy about that. And she passed away a couple of weeks after that. Mm -hmm. And I was very proud that I had gotten to tell her that. And I get weepy if I start talking about this. So I'm going to, change the subject here and now DC has reprinted the new gods over and over again it keeps and it's like it's like okay how much can we charge for it this time <laughs> <laughs> I've had people at DC call me and say can you think of anything else we can put in there to make this new is there anything else we can reprint anything any any people will keep asking me does do you have a lot of Jack's preliminary sketches for those books I go no he never did any but those books have generated a ridiculous amount of income for DC and reprints. One of the many people doing the reprints said to me, God, we wish we had a hundred issues of that stuff. We'd make a fortune with it today. It is now yeah. very commercial and beloved. And um, it was the hit Jack always said it would be. And I am so happy. I have behind me, you can't quite see it in this camera angle. I've got a shelf with all those reprints on it, all the Kirby reprints. And it's on the shelf of my work, but I don't consider that my work. I consider that work I just look at to smile because Jack knew that the books would be out in hardcover, deluxe, fancy, library-type editions for people who just, just didn't want to read it but wanted to own it and maybe pass it on to their kids like a treasured book from your childhood. And they love that material, and it's getting reprinted with beautiful printing and very. I just they sent me the uh, proof sheets of the upcoming reprints of the Hunger Dogs thing, and said, "What do you think Jack would have thought of this coloring?" And the coloring is excellent. It's it's very good. It's very well done. Um, I am very happy with that part of it. I wish Jack was here to reap benefits from. I wish Jack was here. Period. Um, anyway, that is kind of the the the. Um, 
when you say risk factors here, Mark, the one thing I have to point out, because of what we did at that time, every one of those additions has generated money for Jack's family. Right. Now, the success they had in the litigation against Marvel makes it irrelevant to their financial futures. But had that not happened, it's not all, first of all, it's wonderful that the work survived. You know, out, of, out of everything that was published by every publisher in comics in 1970, 1971, 98% of it is mercifully forgotten. Um, and that's normal for media, right? But the, of the one or 2% that has survived, Jack is an enormous share. And the New Gods and Fourth World material, the high, probably the high point of it. But because of how we change things, if Jack's family was the normal set of descendants of an artist in the normal set of circumstances, those checks would matter. And one of the things that disappoints me about how the industry has changed in the years since I was at an executive desk is you see more and more frequent contracts that limit the amount of time that companies are obliged to pay for reprints. And I find it sinful, frankly. You know, if, if the amounts are trivial, yes, there should be an escape clause where you're not sending $11 checks to people for, till the end of time. That's perfectly reasonable. I can live without my McDonald's residuals. Um, but if the, work is, if the work is brilliant enough to survive, Creators should be continuing to benefit as long as there's still people queuing up to buy it and make money for the companies. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, one of the sad one of the sadder ways the industry has backtracked in the, in the last ten four years. In my in my humble opinion, I, I concur a lot, and I'm I'm glad you said some of that, Paul, because I was going to try to lead you into saying it. Um, uh, well, as I'm sitting here, we're, we're running out of time here, but I was sitting here. I have the controls in front of me that, you know, handle the cameras of these podcasts and cut between people and such. And I have a whole bank here of photos that I can pop in. And I just, I didn't hand plan to show this. I, here's a photo I've got up here. This is me and Jack, Jack and I, however you want to put it, at one of the earliest uh, comic conventions in California. This is from, I believe, the Disneyland Comic Convention of 1971 at the Disneyland Hotel. And those are, I think, the second and third issues of New Gods and Forever People Jack is signing there. So it may even be earlier than 71, even. Um, well, they came out in the end of, yeah, Mr. Miracle started it in January. So these, these, are, this is, these issues came out probably around May or June of 71. And he had a whole line of people there signing them. I'm, I'm sitting next to him because Roz used to sit next to him and, and, and stop him from doing sketches for fans. <laughs> and so she, and every so often she had to go to the ladies room. She'd say, Mark, sit here and say no to people while I'm gone. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's how I, I fell as I, as I get weepy for, for uh, remembering my time with Jack, uh, you know that's that is there. And then I also have this photo here that it was taken either by Steve Sherman or me. This is, here's a photo you guys have probably haven't seen. In 1969, uh, uh, I worked with Jack on a Mar a to Toys for Tots campaign. You may have seen that poster Jack did for the Toys for Tots campaign, uh, where Marvel characters were encouraging people to give toys to to this charity and they had a big reception at the Brown Derby restaurant in Hollywood, the famous Brown oh. Derby. And Jack was there and we took this picture. I think either Steve Shermer or I took it. Those are three guys who had been hired to make personal appearances in costumes. The Captain America costume is actually the costume that Dick Purcell wore in the 1940 whatever movie serial. They cut a hole for his ears to, to peek out and put new wings on the on the costume, but the, the costume itself was that costume, and they had somebody make costumes for Spider-Man and Thor, and uh, Jack, we, we said, Jack, would you pose with these guys, and Jack went into his own little superhero pose there, <laughs> and I just thought that was adorable and such. Um, we are just about out of time here. Is there anything we haven't said about Jack Kirby that either of you wants to say? I will say one thing, just because we were talking about the new, the fourth world material. <clears throat> 
I was a comic. I was reading Marvel comics at the end of the '60s. I'd read from the middle of the '60s. I began shifting over toward DC at the very end of the '60s and in the early '70s. They were trying lots of stuff, and I was interested in all of it. A lot of it didn't last very long. It's shorter than the new than the Fourth World. But I knew Jack Kirby, and I was extremely excited as a reader when I heard that Jack was going to DC. And I can only say, what was the first issue that came out? Weren't there three issues of Jimmy well, Olsen that he came did, out? He did, he did three Jimmy Olsons, yeah. the other books yeah. began. And I can remember buying that first issue of Jimmy Olsen quite eagerly at the time and reading it and reading about the Harrys and the J Mountain of Judgment and the Wild Place or whatever it was called. And all that just blew the top of my head off. It was everything <laughs> I had hoped it would be. I thought, oh, my God. I'm enjoying a Jimmy Olsen comic. I can't believe it. So I just want to say that, and the fourth world stuff, I mean, I love a lot of Jack's work. I love all of Jack's work, but I love it. But I, the fourth world stuff is probably my favorite Jack Kirby work. Frank Miller, once we were talking, we were studio mates for a while. We were talking, and he said, and you can argue about this or not, but he kind of felt that the fourth world work in some ways was the first really independent comic to come out. And it wasn't so much that it was published by an independent publisher, but because it spoke so deeply from the heart of the creator in a way that was not as necessarily as true for a lot of the comics, at least back at that time. So I'm just such a huge fan of that material. I'm thrilled as much of it came out as it did. I'm sorry no more of it came out, especially sorry hearing about the sales figures. But, but it did explode the top of my head at the time, and it was just great. Yeah, it was a very wonderful body of work, and and I've had people come to me constantly tell me how much that changed their lives, personally or creatively. Both a lot of people got into comics because of it. Uh, uh, we were told at the time that it was the first, uh, the 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 only. But I, I'm trying to phrase this, the 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 most notable time when the a sales jump in comics could be attributed to the change of creative personnel. One of the few times that the, that the change of artist or writer mattered visibly in the sales. That was this huge jump up. And it was an independent comic in the sense that, that you know, independent comics are kind of typified by the fact that usually only one guy or one team can do them. You can't have a fill-in. You know, Robert Crumb couldn't have done a fill-in issue on Zach Comics <laughs> or something. That it couldn't have, well, I guess that book it was an anthology. But, you know, once you started, you know, the, the, the Peenies couldn't have had a fill-in by a different writer and artist on ElfQuest number three or something like that. It was, it's, it's distinctly the work of, in this case, one man, basically. And, uh, and he changed the whole dynamic of that comic, upsetting those who were sorry that, you know, Jimmy had not turned into a giant turtle man, that issue or something. But um, it was Jack just was a guy who changed the industry everywhere he went, usually for the better and frequently against the will of the industry at the time. So anyway, gentlemen, I thank you for spending this time with me. I hope the storm has passed to where you are. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm good. Thank you all for joining in on this panel. Uh, this will stay up online for a long time. And if you enjoyed it, tell other people to watch this panel. They will learn something about Jack Kirby and comic history from it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Pleasure. Take care. Be well, Wolf.